right to get married, the right to adopt, the right to not be discriminated against. All are liberties the LGBTQ plus community celebrate during Pride. But there are generations who grew up without those rights. And 9 News Morning anchor John Jordan Chavez sat down with a few people who were alive during the 1969 Stonewall riots to see how the world has changed through their eyes. My very first pride is, is uh, just the sense of belonging that I got, the feeling safe to just be myself. And uh, that's, hadn't felt that way for many years. So. It is a lot of fun, but it's also very empowering. And it feels like at that moment, you really are a part of this world, you belong. Today, it's so easy to be open and out versus back then when you didn't dare open your mouth. Yeah, I, I grew up thinking from a very, very early age um, <clears throat> that I'm different. It was very, very lonely. Can you describe that if you feel comfortable? No, not without crying, I can't, so. <laughs> yeah. I, I think Stonewall, to me, was the critical point during which the gay community actually finally became together and started being a, a community. It was the first time that they really stood up to the police, fought back. The media back then was not open to all the different things that make up humanity. Stonewall wasn't put on, on, the, on the radio or TV or any of that. I was married, had a child at that time because I was going to be straight the rest of my life. And you're right, it didn't make the papers or anything. I, I didn't hear about Stonewall till maybe 10 years later when I was out here and it was, it was a pride thing. It came up during pride. And let's not forget to give credit to who was fighting in Stonewall. It wasn't necessarily lesbian and gay men. It was transgendered people and drag queens and they did not become accepted by us for a long time. So they gave us a gift that we did not reciprocate immediately. And as wonderful as life is right now, that dark side is still there, still wanting to take something back. And it's trying to take it back from the same people you were talking about, the transgender yes. people, um, drag queens. You know, I think that's why it's so important uh, that we remain as flamboyant as we are. <laughs> uh, okay. that, that people cannot push us aside anymore and make us irrelevant and pass laws that affect us without us saying or doing anything. I love that. <laughs> That's good. Am I, am, am I flamboyant enough? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Since the time of Stonewall, how have you watched the world evolve, and how have you seen yourself evolve with it? Right, I have no problems talking to people about gay things and gay rights or, or pride or things. And most of the people I talk to are straight. It doesn't really matter. It's just we're part of the world now. It's, it's unbelievable to grow up at the time that uh, I did. And it's unbelievable to see how many parents I know today that support this. But I know there's a whole lot of lives being saved today that were lost, that would have been lost. 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And uh, I'm incredibly grateful for that. The world is a completely different place and I'm uh, still catching my balance. You know, it's moving so fast. So you all sent in these pictures of your younger self. What would you say to that kid that's in the picture? They're lying to you. There's nothing wrong with you at all. It's going to take time, but it definitely gets better. Hope for the future that there's a lot of love out there and you have to let it in. Give it out and you'll get it back tenfold. You have the right to make your own decisions no matter what anybody else tells you. Just keep yourself safe. Oh, and Apple's going to go public in 1980, buy some stock. <laughs>
A big thank you to Phil Wade, Cheryl Evermore, Kenneth Feltz, and Miriam Swihart for their vulnerability and sharing. As we enter the final days of Pride Month, it's important to remember that everything we see and have today, the rights we previously mentioned, all of the public celebrations, the allies who continually show their love and support would not be possible without the fight put up by the generations that came before us. You used Stonewall as a reference point more than 50 years ago, uh, but, but those four, they hadn't met until you put this together. That was the first time they sat down with each other, but it was the changes they've seen throughout yeah. the decades that really seemed to bond them so quickly. And I'm glad you took us all the way back to Stonewall because I think, you know, people were like, oh, well, you know, this is 2023 and discrimination, oppression doesn't exist. It's kind of the same thing, you know, with racism. Segregation was still a thing in the 1960s. This was just 50 or 60 years ago. This wasn't hundreds of years ago that you couldn't live your true self. The Stonewall riots in 1969 were definitely a catalyst for LGBTQ plus rights. And it's understandable that we look to the future. We talk to future leaders. But it's so important that as we do that, we don't forget upon whose backs we are building this future on. I'll stay here for a sec, because now we're going to turn over to Ariel Arsudo. She's joining us to talk about LGBTQ plus sports leagues and what you may not know about them. Well, what you first may not know about them is that they exist right here in Denver for almost every sport. In this week's fair game, we focused our, on four athletes from two different leagues to show that these leagues are more than just for fun. They're serious business and they're seriously shifting the stereotypes around gay athletes. Yes. We, got, we got one more half. We can do this. This is our game. We start tough. I want rough on three. One, two, three. Rough! Let's go! Let's go! It's playoff time for the Denver Gay Lesbian Flag Football League, one of the largest 7v7 leagues in the entire country for the LGBTQ community and its straight allies. It was like, no way. This is way too good to be true. Competitive flag football, uh, LGBTQ plus community. Tim! The emphasis is on competitive. While it's a recreation league at its core, the DGL FFL boasts a handful of former collegiate athletes. Hannah Marsh was a three-sport athlete who played volleyball at UNC Wilmington. It is very competitive. Uh, oftentimes I like to call myself a competitive um, where I just can't let that athlete in me go. And honestly, it, this is the best thing for me because it's family, but also competitive athletic sportsmanship. Kyle Gibson started at catcher for the University of Louisville, even making two appearances in the College Baseball World Series. He said the DGL FFL scratches that competitive itch. Coming from a collegiate background, you get that from this league because everybody's wanting to come out here and compete, be athletic, win a championship. So they're not just coming out. It's not, it's not a beer league softball. Um, it's, it's you're coming out here to play a sport and people are competitive. So you know what you're getting and that makes it fun. In the end of it, I mean, you've got a family, and that's, you've got some people that you're close to. You're out here competing, and those are like the kind of memories that you want to make with friends, um, where you have good times and bad times. So I think that's what this league gives you. Good game, pups! Thank you, rest! Go Miners! Family is the theme over at the Denver Women's Hockey League, where wives Jane and Amy Perulis are a pair of former Division I athletes pursuing competitive play. Listen, she went to UNC, so, you know, she was a, a track and field player. Uh, athlete, oh athlete. Yeah. Jane played on the inaugural women's hockey team at Quinnipiac, so hockey is in her blood. But the former track and field Tar Heel is leaning on her athleticism to try something new. So I've uh, been competitive all of my life, so it wasn't really hard for me to hop right into a competitive team sport. One, two, three, Alabama! So we came out here and heard about the Denver Women's Hockey League, and at first I did not take advantage of it. I kind of sat and I watched, and I kind of got to the point where I was like, I'm done watching. I'm ready to do this. I decent enough on skates. I, you know, I feel like I have some stick handling skills. I'm an athlete. Like I want to do this. I'm going to do this. Determination, perseverance, and competition are not associated with sexual orientation or gender identity. Yet a stigma has been cast over the LGBTQ community that they're somehow unable to properly contribute to elite sports. Just ask these athletes if they subscribe to that stereotype. Early whistle, rap. early whistle. You just prove to them, hey, yeah, I can play. You have talent, you have talent. Just go out and show them. I think we just need to get rid of that stigma. We can be athletes. We can do anything we want to and want to accomplish. And 
There shouldn't be a stigma towards anybody because if anybody wants to be athletic and enjoy themselves, they should have that right. No, that was good deed. So clearly just a sampling of what this whole city has to offer. I mean, there's softball, there's golf, there's water polo. I mean, there's really everything for this whole community. It's just a really great thing that anybody who plays any sport can find their niche here. And actually, Jordan was the one that introduced me <laughs> well. to the Denver Game Lesbian Flag Football League. And the two of us both play in it. I've been playing now for three seasons. It's just an incredible thing. Well, it's, we've always known how much in America sports and society are interwoven, but the generational relationships between uh, the people you spoke to who yeah. were around during Stonewall yeah. and the people today, you see the change and you hope there's more to come. And you imagine that we would never be able to have these types of sports exactly. leagues without them first making their mark and, and being at Stonewall and then just even giving us the opportunity to even just be here, be loud, be proud, just be on this set right now. Um, and that's an incredible thing in and of itself. And But the fact that we could just be out there yeah. playing our sport, just being ourselves, it's, it's really, it's magnificent. Yeah, because of all the people that couldn't be open, the LGBTQ plus people that came decades before us, we now have the opportunity to pull our hamstrings playing flag football. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> freedom, <laughs> freedom to get exactly. Hurt. I've got to ask, is this your wedding blazer? It is. I yes. love that. I uh, love that. It's such an epic choice, by the way. So just a little Easter egg, I guess. That you <laughs> yes, uh, I knew my, it. Today's my two-year wedding anniversary. So congratulations. I, I mean, when else do you really get to wear something like this, other than I mean, at that? So I'm like, <laughs> you know, break it. Out. It's the first time I've broken it out in two years. You wear it well. Oh, I got goosebumps. Thank you. I love oh, that. Thank you. So I mean, hey, pride, right? That's just bringing it all full circle. That's right. Big thanks to both of you. That, that's a lot of work that went into those two pieces, and I think they really they give people at home a great idea of some of the things that have happened and are happening. So Thank well you. done by both of you. Thank Appreciate you. It.